Let's shift gears to talk about the lottery. Your uh, agency, the communications group, actually handles the advertising that is correct. for the state lottery. Uh, I posted a story this week that just based on initial sales estimates, we could be on track to have 520 to $560 million in lottery ticket sales. Right. Now, the, the commission and its staff, uh, Senator Passleg, others, are being very careful right now. And for now, they are still sticking with that initial estimate of about $400 million in sales in the first year. But we're certainly on track for more than that if we were to continue at the current pace. Uh, the first 50 days, about $70 million well, in Well, even sales. that $400 million figure, though, that was a pretty liberal estimate by some. Oh, it, it, it was, was according to some. And, it, and the lottery has proved very popular. Powerball launched, of course, and that gave it another boost. Now on January uh, the 30th, 31st, right at the end of the month, uh, Mega Millions, which is the other multi-state game, is going to launch. The Arkansas Lottery Commission just voted this week to be one of the states that join Mega Millions. So one of the things uh, that the people who came here, Ernie Passleg, uh, David Barden, Ernestine Middleton, who are the three top people that came from South Carolina, really understand is the need to constantly be introducing new games. So you're going to see a constant roll out of new games to keep that fresh. And because of that, I think you'll see sales levels remain very high. So the $400 million at this point might be conservative. We'll, we'll look yeah. back at the end of the first year next fall and we'll see. Do you think our Kansans are just expressing their frustration for years worth yeah. of not being able to play the lottery if they didn't live close to the borders? What, what do you think's driving all of this? Well, I think there's, there's some of that. Obviously, our culture has changed. Uh, you know, uh, when, when you and I were growing up, you could go to Oakland and you could bet win, place, or show. There weren't any many exotic bets there, and there sure wasn't any other legal gambling in the state of Arkansas with the exception of the dog track in West Memphis. You had those two mm -hmm. options, and there weren't any exotic bets there. And now it has become such a part of our culture with all of the surrounding states uh, having either a lottery or casino gambling. Uh, Arkansas had been one of the one of the lone holdouts in that. So yeah, to say there was a pent up demand, I, th I think that would be correct. Yeah, let's turn our attention to state politics. For those who don't know, you were once a political editor at uh, the state's largest newspaper, and you worked for nearly a decade for Governor Mike Huckabee. God bless your soul. I'm glad that you <laughs> survived that. What's your assessment of the polls that we've been seeing on uh, Blanche Lincoln, some of the other incumbents um, here in the state? Uh, do you think that it is it's personal for her and for Vic Snyder and some of these others that seem to be struggling in the polls, or do you think there's just a larger negative political environment right now? I, it's a terrible year to be an incumbent. That's kind of the bottom line. Uh, one of the great things I love, and I think we all love about Arkansas, it's small enough we all know each other, and uh, uh, Senator Mark Pryor's son and my son uh, run cross-country on the same high school cross-country team together. And I was visiting with Senator Pryor, and we were kind of laughing about, boy, did your election not come up at the right time. You you had no opponents. Uh, looks like Blanche may have 30 or 40 the way that it's going right now. And a lot of it does have to do with timing, Roby. You know, when the economy's bad, when people are mad, they tend to want to throw incumbents out. And I think that cuts across party lines. I'll give you an example from the years that I did spend in the Huckabee administration. I went over and I was his campaign manager in 1998. The dot-com boom was still hot. Money was rolling in. The state coffers were full. Everybody was feeling good. The Razorbacks were 8-0 on election day. Uh, they had won those first eight games that year in their first year under Houston. So everybody was feeling good. And Mike Huckabee beat Bill Brusto with 60% of the vote. Now, four years later, we had had the dot-com bust. We'd been cutting budgets. We had cut the Academic Challenge Scholarship, you'll remember, Medicaid. And he went from 50% to 30, 50, um, from 60% to 53%. Same guy. Now, granted, I think Jimmy Lou Fisher was a stronger Democratic opponent than Bill Bristow, but a lot of that had to do with the economy. It had to be do about people not feeling good, being mad at whoever's in office. And I, I think we're seeing some of that right now. So a lot of it has to be, uh, just bad timing for Senator Lincoln uh, when she happens to come up on the ballot in that six-year cycle. What, what does a candidate do when it is that type of environment? Though? I mean, how do you? I mean, you've been there before. How do you? What advice do you give to a candidate to say, uh, "Here's what we're going to have to do to message our way around some of these uh, troubles"? Yeah, well, I just think you have to work very, very hard to get your message out. For instance, I know that Senator Lincoln next week is bringing an Agriculture Committee field hearing here. She's having a breakfast uh, with agriculture and business leaders from across the state of Arkansas. And I think one of the sales points she 
has to sell is, look, I'm about to be chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee in a state as dependent on agriculture as in Arkansas. That's a huge thing. It's not going to be an easy year. I'm, I'm telling you, whoever the Republican nominee is, it's going to be a close race. But what the senator has to do as an incumbent is use that, that Agriculture Committee chairmanship, I think, is a huge boost to her campaign. And she has to make sure she gets the word out to the average Arkansas voter why this is important to them. If I'm a vice president at Riceland Foods, if I work at the Arkansas Farm Bureau Federation, if I farm 3,000 acres in Lone Oak County, I understand how important that agriculture committee chairmanship is. That guy and that lady in the checkout line at Walmart, that's who she's going to have to get the message mm -hmm. across to. She is going to have to effectively make sure they understand that it affects them in a positive way, too, that as Arkansans. That chairmanship position actually has the ability to influence federal policy in a way that, uh, for instance, Tom Harkin had the seat or had the position from Iowa. Iowa farm politics, Arkansas farm politics are different. Oh, this is huge. I mean, I mean if you look back, uh, you know, we go back to the days when John L. McClellan chaired the Appropriations Committee, uh, when you had J. William Fulbright, of course, on the Foreign Relations Committee, on the House side, of course, for many years, Wilbur Mills on the Ways and Means Committee. But when Democrats regained control of the Senate in the 1980s, uh, David Pryor didn't have enough seniority at that point to get a major chairmanship, later got governmental affairs, Dale Bumpers got small business committee, but those weren't major committees. So this is the first time we have seen an Arkansan chair a really major Senate committee in a long time. And like I said, I think the task before all the people that work on Senator Lincoln's campaign is convince the average Arkansan mm -hmm. how important that is. Because the average Arkansan is uh, still hurting from this recession and, and, and probably a little bit mad at, at everybody who's in office right now. We're going to see a lot of agriculture committee meetings here in the yep, state of Arkansas. a lot of feel here. I have a feeling we will. <laughs> All right, Rex, one of the great things about you is we can talk business, we can talk politics, and we can talk culture. <laughs> you have a feature uh, story in our latest edition of Talk Business Quarterly on the King Biscuit Radio Blues program over in Helena on Powerhouse KFFA yeah. with Sunshine, Sunny Pain. Uh, give viewers, give listeners a little taste of what that story is about. Well, I, I appreciate you for asking me to do a feature every quarter that we're going to call Arkansas Institutions. Our first one was on the Snow White Grill down at Pine Bluff, which has been in business since the 1930s. The second one, really, once I got to looking at it, we were talking about three institutions. The King Biscuit Show itself which may be the longest daily running radio program in America. It's certainly the longest running blues radio program. And then Sonny Payne, the host of that show, is an institution. And the old AM station that it runs on, KFFA AM, it is an institution, both in the Arkansas Delta and the Mississippi Delta, when there weren't very many radio stations. A lot of people on both sides of the river uh, grew up listening to KFFA. I, I remember once talking to Archie Manning, who drew up, grew up in Drew, Mississippi, and he said, you know, along with Ole Miss, my other favorite team was the Razorbacks because I listened to Razorback games out of Helena on the radio. We could pick them up so well. Yeah. Well, it's a great piece, and I appreciate you doing that, too. Uh, kind of part of the, I guess, my takeaway from that, too, is, is that marketing the blues is a great way for the Delta to gain a little bit more traction in terms of its economic development. I, I think music in general is really an untapped gold mine for the Arkansas Delta and Arkansas as a whole. Mississippi, frankly, and, and I worked in both states when I was with the Delta Regional Authority, has done a better job promoting its musical heritage than has Arkansas. However, Mississippi's musical heritage is mostly the blues. I mean, you go into Arkansas and you get into rockabilly with, with Ronnie Hawkins and Charlie Rich, and you get into rock and roll, and you get into rhythm and blues. I mean, Al Green was born in Forest City. I think our musical heritage actually is deeper and more widespread than Mississippi's is. We just haven't done as good a job as has the state of Mississippi in capitalizing on that. There are certain, er, certainly some er, efforts in Helena and elsewhere to do that. I think the Department of Heritage is doing a great job with its expansions of the Delta Cultural Center. But I think we can do even more as a state than we have. Um, uh, if you look at trends in recent years, heritage tourism 
Roby, is becoming more and more important. Uh, people have gotten tired of the artificial, of going to a, a Disney World or a Universal Studios or a Busch Gardens. They're looking for authentic. And places, places like Helena, West Helena, are very, very authentic. And uh, that's what a lot of travelers, a lot of well-to-do travelers that have money to spend in hotels and bed and breakfast inns and restaurants are now looking for.